So you're all very welcome to the Inclusive Trinity Awareness Training Series. This is the first of three sessions that will be happening over the course of the semester. Um, this is Trans and Non-Binary Awareness, and it's going to be run today by two of our Trinity Inc. student partners, Mac and Ranjani, who will introduce themselves now before we start off. So thanks, everybody, for coming. Hi, everyone. My name is Ranjani. My pronouns are Z, Zor, and they, them. Don't worry, we'll tell you more about that. Um, I'm a master's student. I'm studying digital humanities and culture. Uh, my name's Mac. I use they, them pronouns. And I'm a third year undergraduate with archaeology. And this is my second year running this training. We're really glad to have everyone here today. This is a bigger turnout than we had last year. And so we're going to start with some definitions and a basic primer on different terms, just to make sure everyone is on the same page before we begin discussion. OK, so first few terms we're going to look at gender identity, sex, gender expression. What is the difference? And yes, there is a difference. Sex refers to hormones, uh, sex chromosomes, reproductive organs, genitalia. Uh, a little disclaimer here. There are there is an identity, also people who are intersex who may be born with a different uh, presentation of sex chromosomes or genitalia than what we consider to be like sexually male or sexually female, and that is also an important part of the conversation. But these refer to mostly biological um, presentations. And some of these can change, and some of them can't, through medical procedures like cross-sex hormone therapy, or um, surgeries like phalloplasty or vaginoplasty. Mm -hmm. now, gender identity is separate from sex, where it is uh, a mental, emotional um, way of that someone identifies, where someone identifies as a woman, someone identifies as a man, or maybe non-binary, or any of the other terms that we will come across soon. And gender expression is how someone expresses their gender through clothing, makeup, hair, hairstyles, hair colors, what have you, right? Um, and even some behaviors. And just remember, all of these exist on a spectrum. Even if you don't think about it, there are socially, biologically, there are peaks where we consider to be the typical, and then there are valleys. And people often do fall between, um, due to a variety of social or medical factors, fall between these peaks and valleys. And a very important thing is that sex is not equal to gender identity, which is not equal to gender expression. Just because someone may express their gender in a particular way that we are designed to think of, doesn't mean they identify in the same way that we interpret their expression. And attraction is a separate factor entirely. Being gay, lesbian, or straight, or bisexual is completely separate from gender. Even though people may have a social understanding of their gender through the lens of their sexual identity, that, that still makes them de different social factors. This is a big list, <laughs> and we don't expect you to remember all of these. Again, we're sending these slides on. It's just so we can all have these conversations with the same language. Oh, sorry, there. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Um, cisgender is anyone whose gender identity and gender that they're assigned at birth are the same. So gender assigned at birth is usually determined by genitalia and, and chromosomes. So it's usually considered XX, XY chromosomes is what we know, right, as chromosomes. So anyone who's cisgender is assigned female at birth and identifies as a woman. Transgender is anyone whose gender identity is not the same as the gender that they identify with at birth. Um, so a transgender man would be someone who, who identifies as a man, but was assigned female at birth. And in a similar way, a transgender woman is someone who, is someone who 
uh, identifies as a woman but was assigned male at birth. Now, non-binary people are those who identify as neither male nor female despite the gender sex that they were assigned at birth. And this is also a, a sense of gender that can change over time. This non-binary identities are not set in stone. It doesn't mean that just because someone identifies as non-binary at one point in their lives, they will identify as non-binary for all time in their lives. It can change. It is also an umbrella term that includes a lot of other terms such as gender queer, gender fluid, agender. And yes, these are a little, uh, I understand they can be confusing. Um, we introduced intersex, physical sex characteristics that are different from what we think of as typically male or female. Um, these are some definitions of terms. Um, it is important to note that intersex people can be cisgender or transgender yeah. because in the normative medical system, intersex people are often forcibly assigned a gender at birth, either based on their externally presenting genitalia or they have surgery to correct their externally presenting genitalia. And so, say an intersex person who was assigned female at birth through a forcibly correcting gender assignment surgery could either transition into a man or stay in their assigned identity as a woman. Um, and now these are gender dysphoria and gender euphoria are terms. Um, Gender dysphoria is a diagnostic term that is that describes a conflict between someone's identity or expression and their assigned gender. So if your identity or expression doesn't match with the gender that you're assigned, it can cause dysphoria. And this is a medical term. This is not simply a feeling that arises. It is a feeling, oh, yes, but it is also a medical term. Gender euphoria, euphoria is not a medical term. It is considered a powerful positive experience when your gender expression or identity aligns. Uh, it's not aligns. Um, how do I explain gender euphoria? It resonates with almost. Yes. Um, and cisgender people experience gender dysphoria and euphoria as well, even if you've never labeled it that in your life. When you have, say you have a haircut that makes you feel like, wow, I feel like a really powerful woman. Or you put on a really good pair of pants and you go, oh, these are solid. I feel like a great man. Those are feelings of gender euphoria. Or even when say a woman is uncrossing her legs and goes, oh, I feel uncomfortable. That is still gender dysphoria because the behavior you're expressing does not correlate with your gender identity. It's just that often these terms are associated with the transgender experience because there's such a sharp contrast and transgender people have to go extra lengths to correct or alleviate feelings of gender dysphoria because the behaviors and presentation that they most resonate with does not align with their assigned gender at birth. And so because there are a million and a half identities and language changes over, or no, you, no, you wanna come to the mic, are you sure? Okay. Because language changes over time and place, we created umbrellas. And so we start with trans identities, which is any identity that isn't a cisgender male or a cisgender female. And then we move to binary identities where someone is transgender, but they still consider their gender identity to fit into the binary model that we've created. So either a man or a woman. Oh. This says non-binary identities. When we brought this over from Canva to PowerPoint, there's some technical errors. 
So these can be non-binary, gender fluid, gender queer, agender, um, polygender, uh, flux gender. In the mid 2000s, there was a big explosion of micro labels where people were trying to find words to define their individual experience because non people do often have individual experiences of gender, but don't recognize it because those individual experiences fit under a normative umbrella of a male experience or female experience. But when you have a non-binary identity outside of a male or female experience, you want to create words that fit how you feel and what your relationship is to your gender. And then we also have non-Western identities. Non-Western cultures have a different understanding of gender and it's important to um, be aware of that and be aware of that identity such as two-spirit, which is an indigenous American gender identity, do not fit into these umbrellas. And so you may have an idea from media that being transgender is a new small phenomenon that only just gained popularity, but almost 1% of any given population will experience some form of gender variance where they identify as something other than a cisgender man or a cisgender woman. In an Irish context, this is about 49,000 people. And for Trinity's student population, this is almost 200 people. This is enough to fill the same lecture theater completely, have people sitting on the floors. That's how many transgender students you should anticipate and expect when you're looking at your class population where you're not just encountering one every 10 years, you're encountering one or 10 or 50, depending on the size of your course, every year, even if you don't know you are. And for intersex people, and we've been hitting on intersex people because often how, because you don't have a personal relationship with students, how you understand a student's gender identity often comes from observations about their gender expression. But intersex students, whether you know they're intersex or not, or they know they're intersex or not, do they have gender non-conforming features or presentation. And so taking into account those observations you might make also apply to intersex students. And so they constitute almost double that amount where almost 400 students in Trinity could be intersex at any given point. The point we're trying to make here is that you're much more likely to encounter a transgender student or student who has a variant understanding of their gender more than you think you are. And so you do need to be prepared. And there is a need in this population for recognition and understanding. On this point, Trinity's community gets more diverse every day. Gone are the 80s and 90s when it's mainly white, Protestant, cisgender people. And so it's up to you to recognize that fact and to recognize these changes and make actions that will include every student you meet, not just the type of students that you expect to meet in your course or at Trinity. And so here's part of our discussion portion. Think with yourself, how often is gender identity relevant to the student experience? Can anyone think of any ideas? Yes. I've had that happen exactly. I had a lecture turn to a group of students and say, okay, girls, you all get together now. And one of those students was a non-binary student and that lecture had no idea. Anyone else?
there's one big material one that I think everyone sort of skims by because you're not used to having to question it. The bathroom. If you're worried about being confronted or being excluded when you go to the bathroom, which is something that someone will have to do at least once a day on campus, how are you supposed to navigate that when you are aware that your gender expression may not fit who people think should be allowed in a male or female bathroom? Oh, yes, of course. Um, sorry, Jeshri in the front mentioned that putting students into group projects is often done by gender as it's just a category that people pull for first. And uh, what's your name in the back? Uh, Mira? Mida? Mida? Um, Mida mentioned that there are a lot of factors depending on different contexts where gender can be relevant, including the gym or on campus or in societies. And so let's go to some like tangible suggestions that will help you navigate um, helping queer, um, helping like gender diverse students. One uh, thing that you can start oh, can with. The title because oh yeah, uh, considering non-binary students. And one thing you can start with is um, ungendering your language. Instead of saying ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, or miss, mister, you can say something like students, hey everyone, hey all. Um, and We've touched on this, assumptions of gender based on fashion or physical feature, how someone expresses themselves may not be equal to their gender identity. Um, again, no non-binary person is androgynous. So just because they look feminine doesn't mean they are female, or just because they look masculine doesn't mean they are male. Um, and you don't need to know someone's assigned gender at birth. It's not relevant to the conversation most of the times. Why is it important for you to know? You need to understand. You need to think of this once before asking. Genuinely, there are really limited circumstances where you would have to know a student's assigned gender at birth. Honestly, you'd probably have to know a student's blood type more of the time. Uh, Now, interactions between specific students is often where gender comes up, making sure that their names are respected, making sure that you get the right name for every student. But gender is also relevant to your curriculum and teaching materials in ways you might not expect. And so, first of all, is to acknowledge and celebrate the accomplishments of trans people in your field or gender diverse people in your field. If you're a history or humanities lecturer who is talking about history or sociology that happened before our modern understanding of gender. And correcting outdated or exclusive language and learning material and making yourself aware of changes in gender norms and culture over time, especially, and if you feel that outdated language is relevant to the discussion at hand, making sure to flag that and flagging for every student in the class that these are outdated terms because you don't know what framework every student in your class is coming from. Making your trans, making transgender non-binary non students comfortable starts with you, but it also starts with the example that you present and the information you provide to the rest of your class. If you're a lecturer in medicine and biology, avoid gendering bodies and physical characteristics. We're saying, oh, men do this and women do this. Giving more specific information about the hormonal aspects or bone structure or organs that inform the information you're trying to provide 
is honestly much more honest and helpful and acknowledges that transgender non-binary people are a reality that your students will encounter if they haven't already. And philosophy, history, and the arts, talking about the change in gendered structures over time and ex encouraging exploration of gender as a concept and definitely highlighting the idea of gender as a malleable social construct Language courses is also a big one where respecting how students want to be referred to in the learning language because a lot of the learning languages here at Trinity are gendered. And so if a student approaches you and said, oh, can I be referred to in the male or in the female? Or can we work together to find alternatives, especially in, especially in exams, for us to be grammatically flexible so that I can learn to refer to myself and my friends and people around me in respectful and accurate ways. Languages like French, Spanish, and German do have movements where people are petitioning for gender neutral language and reworking their understanding of how a gendered language can work for non-binary people. And so investigating that and presenting that information to your students is really important. Allyship with trans and non-binary people needs to be passive and active, where you can, you can start an example by wearing a pronoun button or putting your pronouns in your email signature or leading with your pronouns when you introduce yourself so that it sends the message that even people who are within the norm know that it is better not to assume and to be informed first so that the onus is not put on gender diverse people to inform. If the only person in your class who's saying, oh, my pronouns are this and that, are someone who looks outside of the gender norm, it immediately outs them. And it informs the rest of your class that they are inside the gender norm. And it is okay that assumptions apply to them only for people outside the gender norm. We're working for everyone to stop making these assumptions together. Respecting students' chosen names and pronouns. I understand that this is difficult when you have a large body of students. When you send out that first email, when you start a, lecture, uh, when you start a class for the semester, when you say, oh, this and that is on Blackboard, oh, this and that can be accessed here, just putting a little note at the end that says, oh, and if you have a name that doesn't match what is given to me by the academic registry, or oh, if you have pronouns that don't match the assumptions that I would make, let me know, send me a private email. <clears throat> Knowing, having the anticipation put on you instead of on the student, Letting the student know that you're prepared and ready to deal with the situation and ready to accept them takes a lot off their shoulders when they're going to have five, eight, 12 lectures to have this same conversation with through their college career. And signposting relevant resources for students in need. If you have a personal relationship with students, especially post-grad students or PhDs, and you know that they're gender, diver um, gender diverse, as in like transgender, or non-binary, Fla um, flagging resources like the um, Transgender Student Fund can be massively helpful for them because it's a difficult line to walk to advertise the sources, advertise the resources to people who need it without putting it everywhere and having everyone ignore it. So if you know that someone needs a resource, knowing where to send them or who can help them will be massive instead of putting the pressure on the student to have to help themselves. Um, active allyship is uh, actions that you take to recognize the existence of gender non-conforming and trans students in your classroom and around you. 
something like petitioning for changes in curriculum or university policy. Faculty sometimes in some areas may have more impact than students do, and that can help. Sorry. And you can use your position to help students um, help trans help not only individual students, but also the larger transgender and non-binary student population at Trinity. Um, another thing that you can do is keep an ear out for your colleagues that may accidentally misgender a student, correct them. You may correct, you may need to correct yourself also many times. That is also completely fine. We are all here to learn. Um, and contacting administration when students need a chosen name respected. I think there was a recent um, Blackboard update where you can change your name. Yes. Yeah. And another major place where name changes and the difference between a legal and a chosen name is very important is Erasmus. Ara um, all of the Erasmus paperwork is done through a student's legal name, mm -hmm. but then there is no communication between the home university and the exchange university that a student needs a chosen name respected. I personally had an exchange experience where the exchange lecturer referred to me only by my legal name in communications that were forwarded to the entire exchange group, including students that I knew personally. And having a transgender student's legal name given out is deeply hurtful because it's it's a big yellow sign saying hey look everybody this guy's different this guy well this guy is trans and there are students who are stealth and don't want that information advertised obviously if the student has had a legal name change this is less of a problem, but in college, you are going to mostly encounter people who are early in their gender journey. And so often they're in the middle of, or haven't considered yet changing their name legally, because there are a lot of steps that have to happen before that point. Does anyone have any questions? Oh, I do have oh, yeah. um, pre-submitted questions. Pre-submitted questions also, yes. Well, we made up the pre-submitted questions and then we come to the So, now, so in running tutorials focusing on the theme of gender, how would you recommend balancing the discussion when some students have an in-depth knowledge of gender diversity and others don't believe gender diversity exists? And how do you you do this in a way that no students feel alienated or cancelled among the sorry group. This is an intense one, and that's why we put it first. Um, do you want to start, or do you want to start? Uh, you can start. Do you want to go to the mic? Sure. Okay. In all honesty, let me say, for example, religion is a social construct, even though spiritually. In the divine, religion is real materially to some and simply a social construct to others. But what we can agree on is that religion is a real social construct that exists. Gender and gender variants are the same way, just as religion as a concept has existed for millennia so has gender and gender variants. And so it's not that students don't believe in gender variance as a concept. It exists without their belief, just like religion does. What is true is that some students don't respect transgender students or don't respect the concept of gender variance. But the question you have to ask yourself is, is it academically valuable and reasonable to respect students who don't respect the existence of the concept you're trying to discuss? 
how valuable academically is their contributions if they are unwilling to accept or understand a concept that exists beyond them. In terms of the information gap, where some students obviously have more understanding of gender variance and how it exists within society than others, that can be treated the same as any other knowledge gap, where before a tutorial or a seminar, you can provide pre-readings on gender and gender variance and how it's relevant to the subject you want to discuss. And obviously with the expectations that students who feel like they need that pre-reading will use it. But as a lecturer who trans, transgender people are real. They don't stop existing if people don't believe they exist. If that was true, we wouldn't be having this conversation at all. And so you as an individual have to choose, are you willing to, are you willing to respect more the lived realities of thousands of millions of people or the idea that those lived realities are false or delusional? I know it's strange to answer a question with a question, but it's an important point, especially in sociology and politics and history. That answers that question very well. <laughs> we, we looked at it for a long time and it was very, and there are policies from the college on how to talk about gender. And so if there are specific seminars where you're hitting that issue, you can bring that to your head of school. And if you have specific seminar topics where you would like more guidance, we will have our contact info at the end. And you can obviously reach out, for, um, reach out to us for a structured conversation around specific issues. I'll just read really out the next one that we have. Um, how best to be conscious of trans non-binary identities when onboarding? How best to encourage openness towards alternative pronouns in the office and at events? Arjani, you had a great answer for this. There you go. Oh, thank you. Um, so my answer would be to start small, would be to start simple. Uh, you set an example yourself by using gender neutral pronouns. Don't use he slash she, use they. they use they them pronouns as a default. Uh, giving reading materials or other resources is a good idea. And anyone who gravitates towards certain kinds, such as if they want to listen to a podcast, if they want to read an article, that would also be a good idea to present varied materials. Um, but it would be good to start simple because uh, you don't know where people are coming from, what their background is, if they have any knowledge or any openness to learning about this. So even if people have some knowledge, they they, they would uh, be willing to learn more, but starting small is my answer. Yeah. Oh, I just have some practical, in terms of on onboarding when you're anticipating, obviously you're going to have transgender non-binary colleagues. And so anticipating them could include talking about medical leave and the policies around medical leave, um, especially as often Transitioning and alleviating gender dysphoria often involves a lot of medical procedures. And so having clarity on medical leave policies as that could apply to those procedures is useful. I understand that everyone has to have their official name tag from HR, but including blank name tags or stickers where you can replace or cover up your legal name or have a sticker at the bottom to include your pronouns on your badge is very helpful. And we have a question in the chat. Oh. And there as well. So question about terminology. If we are using male and female for sex, should we therefore be referring to gender identities as men, women, non-binary, etc.? be more inclusive rather than using male and female. 
is apparently these terms all being used interchangeably, including here, and that in itself can be confusing when trying to be respectful. English is a confusing language, Gia, yeah. <laughs> um, and how English is used is confusing. Um, do you have any thoughts on this first? <laughs> um, from what I've seen, male and female are sex descriptors, and then men and women, or man and woman, are gender identities, but in English, people tend to use them interchangeably, especially using male as an adjective, instead of masculine. If you're taught, if you're using, if you're describing a gender identity, saying masculine and feminine is more inclusive than saying male and female. Again, these are all typical. We've been using them all interchangeably. It's especially habitual and the needs and practices of your academic sphere are important to consider. So masculine and feminine um, what would you say is the adjective form of like a non-binary identity? Like, uh, oh, androgynous. And, androgynous, yeah. Are there any... Let's see. Mm. I think there are a number of them. Yeah, masculine, feminine, androgynous, or like andro... I've seen... We used to have a Venn diagram where ma um, man and woman are the two bubbles, and non-binary is everything in between and also everything outside of that, which is a good way to understand it. Um, but typically it's masculine, feminine, androgynous is in the middle in terms of gender identity, and then male and female in terms of sex characteristics. Um, I am not a medical student, so I don't know entirely what the terminology is around describing like mixed sex characteristics. I would have to come back after researching some if you have specific concerns. Any more questions from the chat? Just to respond to that, um, the issue is perhaps that we don't have an adjective to match man, woman, non-binary, but masculine and feminine are also perhaps a little problematic, but this could be discussed for hours. Oh, deeply. It's, yes. again, if there are specific, if you have specific concerns that relate to a specific topic that you would prefer to have a structured discussion about, we have our emails and you are free to email us with any concerns. The final, um, the final question that was in the uh, registration form was just around name, chosen names and um, existing names. I, do, I think we've covered that a little bit, but we'd just like to respond to it again. Um, do you have any, um, I would simply say respect someone's chosen name and use it always. Yes, <laughs> that is a good, um, absolutely always. the best place to start. Yes. <laughs> As someone whose legal name doesn't match their chosen name and who runs into issues constantly with this, um, because the two uh, posts we did last week and now this week are all about legal and chosen names because Often people at the beginning or in the middle of their gender journey go through multiple names. It's not typical for someone to stick with one name until they're farther ahead in their journey, which is why people wait to change their legal name or their name in academic registry, because you can only do that once. And so you have to be sure that this is the name that you are going to use forever. And so, again, like I mentioned, when you make your first opening message to your class at the beginning of a semester, making a note about if people have chosen names um, to contact you is useful. Um, on the point of attendance sheets, I know not every lecture has to face this because some classes are bigger than others and it's just not feasible. But when it is, avoiding legal names when a chosen name is given is very important because it's not just that you know the person's legal name 
it's that every other student in the class who may not have known the person's legal name before now knows that person's legal name. And this, especially when a person is stealth or doesn't or isn't as open about their identity. I mean, personally, I call myself non-binary, but I don't, I'm not going to have conversations with that about every, with every single person in my Latin class. But when I got that email back forwarded to our whole class about Erasmus and had my legal name in big letters, somebody texted me and went, hey, is your real name actually this? And I had to go, number one, I have to process the fact that you know that now when I never anticipated that. Number two, I have to correct you and say, no, that's not my real name. That's my legal name. My real name is different. And also in interactions with that person or in, in interactions with my lectures, constantly anticipating which name they're going to address me by. It's, this is an individual conversation with every student, especially if students live at home or international students who need their legal name on papers because through the Irish immigration system, your name on your passport has to match all of the paperwork that you provide them. And so anticipating where there's a discrepancy, especially when you open yourself up to being welcoming to that information is very useful, especially as a staff or a member of faculty who understands the systems that a student may have to navigate better than a first year who is going through three different names. Including in that little message saying that you're open to students um, needing a name change throughout the year. You're saying like, oh, you can contact me now if, you're ch um, if your name is different than the one on academic registry and you can contact me at any point through the semester. Because it demonstrates that you're anticipating that this is an issue and you are respectful and willing to resolve that issue for students. Because transgender people have to constantly be resolving and navigating these issues through their entire life. And that's a massive stressor. Any questions from the audience? Yes. Um, I just have a really practical question. Oh my God, um, thank you so much for the presentation. It was, like, it was very clear and concise. Obviously that was the most worried. Um, oh, you're too sweet. I have a, yeah, just a very practical question. I was wondering if you just had like a list of resources um, for students who are questioning their identity. And I mostly ask for first years who would teach, who might not know where to go. And I only know faculty. And I'm thinking having a list of resources that are like student group based would be more helpful for me to get them. Do you have anything like that? Um, QSOC is a massive resource. Oh, sorry. Um, the, it was a practical question. Uh, what resources are available for students questioning their identity, especially for first years? Um, I'm actually a member of the QSOC committee. And so directing them to us. We're an entirely student-run organization, and all of us have questioned our identity at some point or another. And so definitely QSOC. Um, I believe there's there's queer group counseling. Um, it's called Rainbow Counseling. Yes, yeah. thank you. Rainbow Counseling that has specific dates. Um, oh, when we email the slides, I can make up a list of resources and we'll attach those with the slides just in case you have students who are asking for resources. Um, yeah, Rainbow Counseling Group, the LGBTRO, um, the LGBT rights officer in the student union, um, their whole job is doing casework around this and talking to students casually who are questioning their identity, as well as resolving practical issues within the college's administrative framework. Any more questions? Honestly, any, pre oh yes, in the back. I'm picturing kind of family discussions 
on the topic of gender diversity and gender variance and also I'm often hit with the extremes of the extremes as to, you know, I read this one article one time in one newspaper where someone identified as a woman or something like that. And therefore trans like or gender diversity doesn't, you know, or how does how do you explain that? So or the, the questions about sports and, or children having barnacles and things like that in quarantine. Um It's definitely a lot of people here in the room. Oh, yes, sorry. Um, just in terms of practical advice for answers to give when your family is coming up with really extreme controversial issues around um, transgender people to ask you about like children taking hormones or trans people in sports or just anything that's come up in the news lately. I know it must be difficult, especially for some of you, to be the most accepting and progressive members of your families. I'm just going to say it right now. No matter what your identity is. Um, and so... These issues are difficult to parse because there's a lot of information and there's a lot of misinformation. And especially if you're not within this community, it's difficult to know which resources and sources to trust. Um, so first on gender identities that seem extreme or deeply non-normative. Um, I'm gonna to refer to our previous point on how gender is an individual experience. And while people within like the normative categories of gender often don't feel the need to parse apart exactly what kind of woman they would call themselves, um, especially non-binary people outside of those want to come up with individual labels or want to find parallels to how gender feels or resonates with them. Like sure there is, there's xenogender, there's cloud gender, but these are all, they're words meant to evoke feelings and words to describe the feelings that resonate or that best describe how and in what way someone resonates with their gender. And that's a deeply individual, philosophical, and sometimes spiritual experience. Um, and often, and so it's not a matter, again, it's hard. I'm sure you found this in your life in different ways where it is difficult to put words to what can be a deeply individual philosophical experience. Again, the way, I don't mean to keep bringing religion parallels into it, but I find it useful as like a social construct that some people understand as a material real, where the material reality is the same thing as the social construct and other people separate them. It's the way we think about it in society is useful. Anyway, um, it's like how some branches of religions have very strange um, language for describing religious experiences. It's just about describing an individual philosophical experience is why some extreme or extremely non-normative language is used. Um, for transgender people in sports, it's very simple. Mo um, most, if not all, sports organizations require you to be on hormones for a certain amount of time or have had gender-affirming surgeries so that your like body profile meets the bo matches the body profile of people you'll be playing against, number one. Um, again, there was a recent movie, Lady Ballers. They wanted to make a documentary, but found that no, people who fit the 
body profile of a cisgender man cannot join women's teams because they identify as a woman for a joke. Um, women, including transgender women, do have to be on hormones for an extended period of time to, jo to join women's sports leagues to accommodate for um, these typical body profiles, number one. Number two, there are other biological ways where people who participate in sports vastly differ from an average body profile. Think of Michael Phelps' very long arms. Him swimming against any other person would be deeply unfair and disadvantage that other person in any race. You would complain if you had to swim next to my Michael Phelps, but you wouldn't complain about having to swim next to him in the Olympics because his atypical like biological traits are what give him an athletic advantage. And so why do we not complain? Um, why do we consider those fair where we consider different levels of testosterone unfair? There are a lot of other, there's many other aspects to this debate as to how we understand gender. Um, but those are the basic two points I always mention. Um, and that one about children on hormones. Number one, even adults in Ireland can barely access hormones. And so in, and number two, even when people under 18 are able to access hormone therapy, what is often medically recommended is puberty blockers up to the age of 15, 16, 17, and then cross-sex hormone therapy. No one is changing the puberty of a 10-year-old. Typically, people are on puberty blockers until other cisgender peers their age um, have passed puberty around 15, 16, 17, and then they start on cross-sex hormones. And often at this point, if a person is on puberty blockers, they've begun thinking about their gender earlier than some of you may have even picked your careers. And they're sticking with it for life. Oh, five more minutes, okay. Are there any other practical questions? especially in terms of relating to transgender students. Um, I just want to add one thing. Yes. Uh, to Max's answer. It was a very good answer. Um, I've had experience, as I'm sure a lot of people have, right? Talking to people, especially family members who don't believe in transgender people. What I can do is I can present facts. I can say that there have been studies done. Um, I can say that this is not a new thing. I can, I can just present facts. If they are not willing to listen to facts, if they think a random newspaper article written by like an op-ed is a fact, that is on them. That is not something that I can change. And what I, what, I, what I can do is I can go on my Instagram and I can share a post talking about non-binary identities. And my friend who may not know much about non-binary identities but wants to learn, can learn from that Instagram post. So we can do certain things, but there are certain things that we can't do. Mm -hmm. You can fill the knowledge gap. There's no filling the respect gap. People have to do that themselves. It, this, 
Oh, of course. Um, the question, um, the comment was that there could be issues with GDPR in terms of sharing people's legal names and addressing the issue from that front could help challenge some of these problems, especially in terms of sharing people's legal name to a whole peer group. Um, part of the problem is that there have been issues with the name associated with students' email. Again, a lot of these issues are administrative, and so we understand that you may not have the power to change them. It's more that you have the knowledge to understand and course correct them or direct students on how to address them or who can address them. It, that is definitely true. And if you're able to use that argument to prevent this problem, absolutely all power to you. Um, again, the main takeaway that we want here is that we want you to be aware that some, that you should confirm, especially if there's situations where you're addressing a student by their legal name or a legal name has to be sent, confirming with that student that it's okay that a legal name is communicated to other people is important. And then in terms of attendance sheets or other spaces where it's not necessary, but it's the first information you get, creating channels for students to share preferred names throughout the semester is the best solution. And if you run into other creative solutions, honestly, do let us know. We run this training every year and we love giving staff and faculty the most information they can get. Oh, yes? Oh, we, or, oh, sorry. Um, just because one person is leaving, let's just skip to the, sorry, we don't want you to run. Um, we just, we don't mind if you run away. Um, but just write down our emails if you feel the need. These will be set with the slides. Okay. Just wanted to say this before anybody else had to go. Thank you so much. And so, yes. Okay. Um, just to repeat for everyone on Zoom, so you were saying that even in a clinical setting, you get questions about extreme gender identities, but the like psychological, psychosocial approach to addressing gender, especially in terms of the DSM-5, has changed significantly over the years. Um, as understandings of gender and gender identity have changed especially with the ba um, the banning of conversion therapy. Take care. Um, and so it's important to question 
why people feel such strong feelings that they feel the need to disrespect the existence of trans people and questioning those and forcing people to question those feelings directly is much more useful in those conversations. Yes, of course. Fantastic. Um, we will, sorry to run over time. We do have some other useful like basic summaries. And again, we have our emails in the bottom. Again, um, also, um, I will say since this is a recording, if you want to create a, a school specific training, absolutely reach out to us and we'd be happy to work with you on that or to work with your head of school or head of department on that. Um, or if you have specific issues that require a more structured conversation, such as like um, tutorial topics you bring up every year or specific students and casework, we can either direct you or we can have a structured conversation with you. Um, the rest of, just because we're over the hour, the rest of these slides will be, or actually, will, they'll be sent off? Okay. And please do come next year. Thank you very much. Thank you. And come to the rest of the inclusive um, trainings this week. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody. Did, yeah, the, the, the rest of the sessions are all across this semester. So the, the oh, thing. yes, of course, sorry. Thanks everybody online and for joining us in person today. Um, and hopefully hear from you all soon. Thanks for coming um, very much, everybody, for attending.